So hi everyone and welcome and thanks for attending today. This is our first lecture in our new online series, Sustainability and Climate Change in Northern Ireland. So our first guest speaker is Professor John Barry. And John Barry is Professor from the School of History, Anthropology, Philosophy and Politics at Queen's University, Belfast. He is Director of the Centre for Sustainability, Equality and Climate Change Action, Co-Chair of the Belfast Climate Commission and a member of both the Place-Based Climate Action Network and the Climate Assembly UK Academic Panel. So today, Professor Barry will be discussing how we can respond locally to the planetary emergency. And please remain muted for the duration of the talk. And just to let you know that this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the school website and other social media channels. And following Professor Barry's talk, attendees can ask questions either by typing them or you can use the raise your hand function to ask your questions verbally. And please unmute your microphone whenever you're called to ask your question. So that's it. And um, I'll pass you over to John. And just to let you know also, that presentations, this presentation will be emailed and the evaluation survey will also be emailed at the end. And yeah, uh, verbal questions will also be answered first. So thanks, and I'll pass you over to John. That's great. Thank you, Shannon, and, and thank you, Tanisha and Michael, for organising today. And you're all very welcome, those of you out in cyberspace. Um, I've written you a long talk because, in the words of Winston Churchill, I haven't had time to write you a short one. Uh, no, I'm only kidding. I've got a lot of things to say. And they are more around provoking us into thinking, particularly in the context of the pandemic. So uh, if you want one term to kind of summarize what I have to say, it's building back better, is that we should use the opportunity as we come out of the COVID crisis to unlock ourselves from unsustainable forms of heat production, transportation, food production. So my view is here, we shouldn't go back to normal. We should be building back better. So what I want to begin from, this is a, a man that some of you may or may not know. He's not certainly somebody I would agree with politically. He was one of the architects of neoliberal capitalism that informed maybe Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan in the 1980s. But even though he comes from a very conservative right-wing uh, position, I think the point he makes about the importance of a, of a crisis uh, as an opportunity to radically restructure societies is an important one. And those of us interested in sustainability, and I'm presuming people on the call here are people interested in sustainability, should be seeing what in either our experience now of the crisis, you know, there are environmental benefits for those of us lucky enough to have jobs, to be able to work from home, or what we can see coming out of the crisis, can we see a different type of, what well, I would say a green, low carbon and socially just uh, society because another term you could use to describe what i'm uh, talking about here is not just build back better but what we want is a just transition from a carbon-based high capitalist consumer uh, economy to one that is low carbon more resilient and focuses on human well-being and not necessarily an economic growth although i won't have time to go into that in too much detail so what are the lessons we can uh, see from the uh, COVID-19 crisis? Well, lo and behold, um, despite 30 years of attacks on the state, particularly from neoliberal economics, that the market was always best to deliver goods and services, the state was a fetter and you know, red tape preventing entrepreneurial activity and so on, we can see that in a crisis, it's the state that saves you or at least tries to, um, not a free market actor. So states can move quickly, despite the fact that many of us have been brought up in cultures and societies where the state has been denigrated for quite a long time. We also see that finance can be found, uh, despite former British Prime Minister uh, Theresa May, who infamously said, there is no magic money tree. Well, guess what? We have found that the state can find resources to furlough workers, to commission PPE equipment very quickly uh, for its citizens and frontline workers, although not uncomplicated, and we could go into that maybe in the Q&A. We can see that people can adapt, you know, by and large, uh, populations where we've had to endure lockdown, social distancing, working from home, people have by and large uh, obeyed, and we've had evidence of social innovation. I mean, there's been lots of apps that's been developed or, or, or upgraded as a result of the, the pandemic of reconnecting people, uh, even locally in terms of neighborhood help and so on. So people feel, yes, the state is taking a leading role, but also people can uh, respond in, in, in a very positive manner. 
And one of the ways in which people have responded is in forms of solidarity. Yes, we've seen, you know, places like America, where you have some very far right Trump supporters coming out with guns, you know, threatening to, you know, I don't know what they're threatening in terms of a revolution so they could be un unleashed from lockdown in Michigan. That really is a, a very minor experience for most people, whether it was the clapping for our frontline workers every Thursday, did a genuine sense of people helping the vulnerable uh, in our communities. I think it, it, it has been a noticeable part of the pandemic. We've also found ways of communicating complex issues to our publics. Most of us now are kind of amateur epidemiologists. We all have that image in our head of flattening the curve. Well, I think that image of flattening the curve to spread out the pandemics so of the healthcare systems are not overwhelmed, that could be used and adapted to bending the curve down, except the curve in this case is greenhouse gas emissions. So I do think that we can, there are lessons in terms of communicating climate action we can learn from the COVID-19 crisis. And we've also seen, you know, whether it's our, our, our own local politicians here, Arlene Foster and Michelle O'Neill and Robin Swan, all saying they're going to be led by the science and so on. For the most part, although it has been uneven, you know, there are going to be interesting issues in terms of a public inquiry into how the crisis was handled in the likes of Sweden, England and America, where we've had very different outcomes. Um, but by and large, we've had a science-led, medical-led, public health, epidemiology-led uh, response to uh, dealing with the crisis. And wouldn't it be nice if that's how we were to design our economic policy in our climate changed, carbon constrained world? So if, if, if the politicians are listening to the science around the pandemic, why don't we see the same attention to the climate science in designing our economic policies in particular? We've also seen in the crisis that once impossible policies, such as effectively universal basic income, uh, which is now going to be implemented in, in Spain, uh, the effective renationalizing of public health care systems across many parts of Europe, again, which goes against the tide of privatization and of outsourcing uh, these services. We've seen that these once uh, utopian, unrealistic policies are now eminently not just necessary, but actually desirable. And we've seen some positive environmental and climate impacts. I mean, many of us have seen those pictures, although they've changed now of the air quality in China improving as a result of the pandemic starting in Wuhan and the reduction then in, uh, in, in industrial activity, quickly coal-fired factories and so on. That's now been reversed, of course, as the factories have got back up and running. We've seen pictures in Venice of sea life returning to the area as the, the waters clear because, again, reduction in uh, tourism and so on. So this is not to celebrate, uh, you know, that, that this came out, these positive environmental impacts came about for a very negative reason, you know, people losing their jobs or having to be furloughed and so on. But this, this show us that we can see how nature can recover quite quickly uh, as soon as we take, um, you know, our foot off the brake, or sorry, foot off the accelerator, particularly of carbon-based industrial activity. And there's no doubt about it. We are heading into a recession. Uh, in terms of many parts of our economy are going to suffer very badly. Look at like the airline industry, um, over 80% uh, reduction, our retail sector, tourism, our agri-food sector. So there's no doubt about it that the, this isn't all going to be positive. It, how can it be given the death and destruction that the COVID-19 virus has created? But I do think if you list all of those, and I, I've only given you a few, you can come up with your own. I think we do have some warranted uh, you know, evidence that we can rise to the challenge then of the planetary emergency. And by the planetary emergency, I'm, I, it's a composite of the climate and the biological or, or, or biodiversity crisis that we're, we're facing. And therefore, I, to go back to the issue of, of building back better, I do think that we do need to see uh, you know, citizens, uh, political parties, faith groups, trade unions, uh, universities getting involved in uh, the debate around building back better and that we have green, low carbon and just inclusive policies as we come out of the pandemic. So I do think that particularly for Belfast, because I'm involved with the Belfast Climate Commission, which I co-chair, that's our singular issue now. How are we going to provide jobs? And actually, as an aside, particularly for those of you who are economists, we should have a jobs-led recovery, not an economic growth-led recovery, because what we need are jobs and not to be uh, you know, focusing on how we used to do business as, 
as usual in terms of competitiveness, FDI, and so on. This is about jobs. So where are the green jobs going to be found in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and other places? And I don't think we should go back to normal. Normal was the problem. Normal was ecocidal. Normal was unjust. So I, I, I do despair when I hear people, and I, can, I know what they're trying to get at, you know, let's get back to some degree where we're not locked in our houses. But really, to go back to that Milton Friedman idea of a crisis as an opportunity to disrupt normal and to build back, as I say, better, so that we, we, we have a more inclusive and green infrastructure, energy system, transportation, and so on. As we see in other parts of Europe, and there's a little bit of evidence of this in Belfast, where there's temporary pop-up cycle lanes over the city. I'd rather see those to be permanent, for example, and to do what they have, the ambition in Paris and Milan, who have ambitious plans to build thousands of, of extra miles of you know, walkable, cyclable, safe places where people can have a choice uh, not to uh, go in their car and so on. And these are some examples of what the crisis has enabled in terms of these new, new ways around transportation. I also think just to be very practical and local, I think a green recovery strategy for Northern Ireland in particular should be around retrofitting our housing stock. You know, we have very badly insulated houses, uh, which means people are heating the street in winter. It also leads then to energy poverty, where people have to make the awful decision, do I heat or eat? So it's compromising their ability to have a good quality of life. Often these very badly insulated houses, and sadly some of you, particularly if you're students, you may have experienced living in one of these properties. They're also very bad in terms of respiratory problems, given mould and so on. That can, uh, that can occur. And also the fact that in Northern Ireland in particular, we're overly dependent upon oil for space heating, uh, which of course is a very carbon intensive fuel. Uh, it's also, uh, we're importing it. Why aren't we using our local, you know, uh, wind and wave and sun to create local sources of, of electricity for our homes? And the last reason for uh, a retrofit program, it'll provide jobs, uh, non-outsourceable jobs. So these are the types of ideas I think that I'd like to share with you. I'm sure you've got some out there yourself in terms of where are these, you know, those policies that can provide multiple co-benefits, reduce carbon, keep people safe and warm in their home, give them extra disposable income, provide jobs. I mean, there's a quadruple win. These are the types of policies we need to see uh, as we build out of the recovery. There's also then more procedural issues. And it's certainly something that's a live debate within environmental organisations and certainly in the Belfast Climate Commission of having a citizens assembly or a citizens jury and asking our local uh, communities what do they see as the recovery plans in their local area or what they would like to see for, for Belfast. And we can't forget that we, we're going to have to build in climate adaptation. Uh, even if we're to stop all burning of fossil fuels and the production of methane from you know, grass-fed beef and so on, we will have to deal with some inevitable climate changes in the decades ahead. So we have to build in our plans climate resilience and climate adaptation, as well as uh, energy decarbonisation. And we really do have to start seeing, well, where are the nature-based solutions, whether they're for providing jobs, you know, should we not be paying, you know, for example, be paying farmers to sequester carbon as opposed to you know, uh, digging up hedgerows and engaging in a very carbon-based and chemical-based form of agriculture. So these are the nature-based solutions in terms of uh, you know, our, what I'm calling here the green and blue infrastructure. And we often forget about the blue infrastructure, the marine environment as part of a, a very important part for, for livelihoods in terms of fishing, for tourism, uh, but also as a, a place that is teeming with biodiversity that we have to protect. So we have some good starting points. Uh, this is the new decade, new approach agreement that uh, restored the Northern Ireland Assembly back in January. This is just some of the sections that they have on uh, the Green New Deal and the idea of uh, you know, tackling climate change and having an independent EPA. So it's all very good, you know, don't get me wrong, but I tend to be cynical about um, these documents because they often can end up a bit like the Irish football team great on paper, crap on grass. You know, it's no good having a lovely, shiny policy, strategy, idea. We need to see action. And that's why I do think that it's a, um, a particular problem that we've had the Northern Ireland Assembly. We've had many local councils in Northern Ireland. We've also had the British Parliament and the Irish Parliament. All of these places of governance 
have declared climate and ecological emergencies over the past year. But how do we know as citizens, if you're a, a, a resident of Belfast, did you know that Belfast City Council declared a climate emergency last September? Is our lives any different? So my proposal here would be what we're witnessing in the COVID pandemic, that's what a real emergency looks like. Determined action by the state, changes in behavior by citizens. We don't see any of this when it comes to the climate emergency. So we're back again to seeing how can we learn from the COVID emergency and read across some of the uh, uh, you know, positive elements of how that was communicated, some of the policies that were implemented, can they be implemented in terms of tackling the planetary emergency. So some of the you know, levers we have here, again, just to give you some more local examples. So let's act as if it is an emergency. And particularly for local authorities, I mean, they're used to dealing with uh, emergencies. They can coordinate very effectively around flooding, major traffic incidents, and so on. So you could say that my argument here is to, is to really beef up, as an odd word to use as a good vegan like myself, but anyway, beef up the capacity within local uh, authorities to be able to coordinate activity around responding to the climate emergency, which would you know, require identifying what are the powers local government has. So the issue here is that we have all these emergencies being declared, uh, but where's the action? And I, I think cynicism can set in uh, by citizens if we don't see at the local government level in particular, never mind central government, major changes in how our transportation system operates, how our food system operates, how we're producing electricity, we need to see radical step change in that in the same way we've witnessed radical step change in response to the COVID-19 crisis. And here's just some of the examples, speaking for those of you from Northern Ireland, these are some of the powers that we have in our local council that can help us in terms of, um, you know, dealing with the planetary emergency. I'll just flag up, and maybe for Shannon and Tanisha, this could be a really interesting separate meeting uh, with somebody else or, or, or a panel discussion. Some of our biggest challenges in, in, in the, in the uh, just transition and the sustainability transition in Northern Ireland is going to be around agriculture because we have a very heavily carbon-based agricultural system, highly dependent upon often imported forms of carbon, very highly chemicalized. And just for example, the nitrogen, which is a major component of our agri-food system, that takes a lot of carbon energy to, uh, to create. And we can't continue with this very heavy carbon-based form of agriculture. So I do think, you know, it would be worth having a separate meeting around what, what is the just transition for agriculture? I'll just leave it at that. What is the just transition for agriculture as we go forward in the years ahead? So I'll just give you an example and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop and we can have a discussion. We on the Belfast Commission have, um, we've, conducted our own baseline research, which is going to be uh, launched in public in the next couple of weeks. It's kind of a, basically a mini Stern review. It's uh, named after Lord Nicholas Stern, who did the initial economics of climate change for the then um, treasurer, uh, Gordon Brown, back in 2006. So we've mapped uh, as best we can with the available data, the carbon profile of Belfast, and out of that then identify what's the decarbonisation roadmap for Belfast. And it's against the backdrop that many of you may know if you're interested in, in, in climate politics and, and climate breakdown. So we have to keep our average levels globally to 1.5. This is based upon the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So the argument here is that we need to move fairly quickly. We've got about a decade in terms of making our biggest strides in reducing our carbon intensity if we are to have a good chance of keeping to within that 1.5 degree warming. And what we've done is we've disaggregated the, uh, the data from the IPCC and you have the figures there in terms of what's our budget. In other words, that's what we're allowed to emit in terms of greenhouse gases and, and particularly carbon if we were to stay within that 1.5 degree um, bubble or uh, option by 2030. And what's interesting here, again, just a bit geeky, but it's important, our roadmap does not take into account all the goods uh, that we've bought in from China, Malaysia, the Middle East, all of which, of course, come with a carbon uh, footprint. We're, we're just looking at territorially based, uh, largely around, you know, energy production, electricity, heating, cooling, 
and, and transportation. So we're not taking into account what's called scope three emissions. We're just looking at scope one and two. And here's what we found. The good news is emissions in Belfast have fallen. Uh, that's largely got to do with the uh, increasing penetration of particularly wind, mostly onshore wind energy in Northern Ireland. But the reality here is that our output emissions will increase, uh, sorry, will have fallen if we keep going um, into, you know, continuing that trajectory, we'll have fallen by half by 2050, but we need to get to net zero by 2050. So what are the, uh, the policy options? And I'll give you one example or two examples in, in, in a moment. So there's just some, some figures in terms of we need to make our biggest uh, reduction in our carbon emissions within the next decade. And thereafter, we take off smaller bites of uh, our, our carbon budget to get us to net zero by 2050. So basically, the argument here, the majority of all our emissions reductions has to take place within the next 10 years. And that's, of course, a major technological, social, behavioral, political, and indeed, I would say, cultural issue for the city. Well, some of the advantages of doing this, the economic case, you know, there are some figures, I won't read them all out, I mean, some quite eye-watering figures. And again, because we're such an oil-based economy and society, most of that money is simply going out of Northern Ireland. Uh, we're, not, we're not keeping that money within Northern Ireland, it's basically going outside because we're having to import uh, gas and, uh, and oil in particular. But with some modest investments, again, there are big figures, we can make savings. So for me, it's a, it, you invest to recoup savings down the line in terms of money, particularly in terms of energy efficiency, energy conservation, energy reduction. All of these things are going to save you money as well as reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It has the potential of creating uh, employment prospects um, as well. But also it's these multiple co-benefits of decarbonizing the city. We can reduce congestion if we increase the you know, people, uh, you know, undergoing what's called a modal shift, getting them out of their internal combustion engine cars, onto public transportation, working from home, as we've all, some of us, you know, with jobs that can do this, as we now, now learned, we can reduce the amount of traffic on the road, reduce air quality, or sorry, improve air quality across Belfast. We can reduce fuel poverty if we have a retrofit program and improve public health and welfare overall. I think that's a really important issue in terms of communicating the transition from a very uh, high-carbon consumer-based capitalist system. There's a lot of C's in there, I know. But we need to maximise what are the co-benefits. So it's not just reducing greenhouse gas emissions, as important as that is. It's about providing jobs, increasing, you could say, energy security. Uh, if we re-indigenise more parts of our electricity production as opposed to being dependent upon states like Russia, uh, or the Middle East um, for our sources of, of oil. And here is some of the most effective. So this is going to you know, reduce our carbon the most in, in the city. Again, I've mentioned already retrofitting, particularly in terms of both the public and the private sector housing stock. As I say, largely as a result of the profile of very badly insulated houses in, uh, in Northern Ireland, coupled with the fact that there, with the one part of the British Isles that is most dependent upon oil. Uh, other places, it's more gas, which is a, a less carbon intensive, uh, it's still a, a fossil fuel, obviously, but less carbon intensive than, than oil. So retrofitting is a good value for money, uh, but also to cool. You know, even a day like today, we suddenly begin to see that, yes, uh, we do need to cool our, uh, our, our homes and our uh, commercial premises, even in, uh, in Northern Ireland. It's no longer the case that it used to be years ago we used to say, summer in Ireland, best weekend of the year. Uh, <laughs> that may be, I hope I've not put the hex on now, was having a good summer. But we do need, and we often forget, to build in how we cool our buildings and homes, as well as how we, we heat them. And there's also then, in terms of Belfast, is very heavily dependent upon the internal combustion engine car for transportation. And this adds then to quite a lot of its carbon footprint and its carbon profile. So moving people out of their cars, having a, a better mix of motorised, yes, uh, public transportation, absolutely. But really, can we start reducing the need to travel for those who have jobs that can do so? And certainly the COVID-19 crisis has really brought home for a lot of people, well, maybe I don't need to go into the office five days. Maybe I can go in only two or three with all the multiple benefits uh, that that will bring. 
So what we need to do is, is as I say, build back better. In my view, we need jobs, uh, not necessarily growth. Maximize the co-benefits from any proposal that we are putting out there. And there, just as a summary, I think transportation, we need to re reduce our dependence upon the internal combustion engine car. We need to reduce our dependence on space heating uh, in terms of oil, and that is a retrofit program, as well as moving away from oil for, for space heating. I should just say as an aside, I mean, for those of you who, who perhaps don't appreciate, many of you probably do, but as we move to a low carbon world, we're talking about the almost complete electrification of our lives moving away from coal, oil and gas means that uh, in terms of transportation and heating and so on, we're talking about electrification of our lives. And then of course the biggie uh, that I'm proposing, maybe we have a separate meeting on uh, in, 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 in the days ahead of, the, of this program of a just transition for the agri-food sector and so on. So the takeaways from this, we do have a massive scale and urgency issue you know, we cannot uh, go back to normal. Uh, therefore, reform and minor adjustments will not suffice. And, and the language the university uses, this is the grandest of all great grand challenges that humanity faces. In some respects, although it's often overplayed, our response to the COVID-19 crisis has been, you know, uh, testing our muscles in some ways. It's a, a warm up for whether or not we can rise to the challenge of the opportunities as well as the challenges of addressing the planetary crisis. So we need a fundamental transformation of systems. And it's useful to think in those systems terms that we need interdisciplinary work and not to be working in silos. We need mission-led, uh, you know, evidence-based changes in, in, in terms of what's going to inform our policy. And, and it does mean an opening and a desire for novel and transformative ways of working together. And it does mean that a just transition you know, that we should, you know, the, the, the most poor in our society shouldn't be the one that are negatively impacted on this. Uh, and that also means consumers shouldn't have to be paying more for their energy. Although there's a, a big issue in terms of food. Are we paying too little for our food? Again, that's perhaps a controversial issue that we can come back to either in the Q&A or a future uh, meeting. But there is something around saying that our cheap food is at the price of the externalizing of the negative impacts of that cheap food system onto the environment and indeed on, on the people and uh, the non-human the non -human world. So I do think we need beyond reform and beyond business as usual. So we need to have this, uh, to me it's an exciting prospect of almost, you know, the idea of working as if we're in the early days of creating a better society. Yes, climate breakdown is scary. If you read the science and you aren't scared, you're not reading it correctly, but there is always hope. Human beings are a, res a, a very resilient species and people. And we do have to roll up our sleeves now, I think, and really start addressing the, what the science is telling us in terms of tackling our planetary emergency. And one of the reasons why people resist this, some of you have seen, if you heard me speak before, you might have seen me use this diagram. This is the Kubler-Ross change cycle. And it's basically uh, an analysis on psychology of, of what happens to people and sometimes to communities when they're faced with something shocking. You know, usually it's in the context of you get a, a, you know, a diagnosis of, of, of cancer or you're told of a bereavement or something. First, we, it's shock and then this uh, denial. Uh, then they get some degree of frustration, depression. And I think this can be applied to how we as individuals or as communities are responding to the climate breakdown. You know, we have a lot of people, some of them in public life, in denial, who deny climate breakdown is real. Uh, that's the likes, of, the likes of Sammy Wilson's of this world, you know, the DUP MP, who seems to take great delight in challenging the, the scientific consensus around climate breakdown. He's also probably in the frustration because he always seems to be permanently angry uh, as well. But I think this is a useful way for us to try and say, well, where are we as, a, as individuals or as societies on the acceptance of climate breakdown and how to respond to it? Because what we need to do and certainly for Northern Ireland, is make plans that are going to excite people. Uh, and the next comment here, again, I speak as somebody who, uh, although I was raised a Catholic, I'm, I'm probably more of a completely collapsed Catholic now, not even a lapsed one, but I do think the Bible has some good lines in it, and this is one of them here, where there's no vision, the people perish. And I think certainly for Northern Ireland, that's what we lack. 
what is the shared vision for Northern Ireland? I think, again, without being too romantic about this and too dewy-eyed, is there something in this green transformation of just transition, uh, a building back better narrative for Northern Ireland that can bring together people and we can put aside or we can integrate in some way our standard sectarian politics, which holds us back so much? So I leave you with this final thought then. We we'll forgive him his sexism, but he was writing back almost 100 years ago. So anyway, I leave it there and happy to take any questions people may have. Well, thank you, John. That was great. Definitely giving us food for thought. Um, if anyone would like to ask a question, there is the Q&A function just beside the chat and in between participants. So you can type your question or there's a raise your hand function where you can raise your hand and then we'll get to your question. So there we are. Shannon, if you want to take a question there from Chris McCallum. Hi, John. Hi, Chris. How's it going for you today? Oh, another Monday lockdown. Paradise. Uh, I know it's great working in academia this way. Um, just a general one. Um, whenever you're talking to people and battling this issue, as it were, how do you keep yourself informed about what the other side is doing and how they're getting their information or does that not play into it for you so that you can actually argue with climate change deniers um, with the information and how to debunk their information or is it better to go with your approach and just go in this is the information that I've got? Uh, it's a really really good question particularly um, in societies like uh, America, Australia and to some degree in Northern Ireland, we have a probably higher than average uh, number of, of politicians and our citizens who are probably climate skeptics, if not climate deniers. My own view after 30 years of, of talking to these people, uh, some of them, uh, there's no point in, 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 in giving them more, uh, more conclusive scientific evidence. That's not going to convince them. I've certainly come to the conclusion that what we need to do is, is, is in challenging the climate skeptic story, is to have a more positive, uh, you know, climate breakdown story. That's, you know, it's, it's the narrative. Um, because people who are convinced, you know, whether it's, you know, that does tend to be a correlation of people of a certain religious disposition, as well as being more conservative and perhaps more uh, right wing, that they're not going to be convinced by the science. So having more and more, you know, here's the peer reviewed evidence is not going to work with people like that. I found, um, and again, I speak, as some of you know, I'm also a recovering politician. I was a Green Party councillor here in, in North Down for seven years. So I've had lots of interactions with uh, the public and lots of, you know, interactions with climate deniers uh, as well. And what I found that sometimes works, particularly with those who maybe have a religious basis for saying only God can change, you know, the climate and so on, is to say, well, if you're a Christian uh, and you believe in stewardship, uh, surely, you know, that doesn't sit well that we're basically wrecking the planet, that this is a, a bad sign of, of the stewardship over the planet of God's creation by human beings. And I've often found, again, it doesn't always work, Chris, but when I ask people, well, say, well, what would Jesus drive? And it begins to sometimes, you know, uh, open them up to the possibility that maybe aspects of this green transition debate uh, is something that has a connection with their faith commitment. Um, but just to reiterate, I have found that there's no point in wasting your time and energy, precious as it is, you know, with, with a convinced climate denier, more science and evidence ain't going to convince them. But a story might, and particularly not to be speaking down at them, uh, I've often found quite useful because often academics and so on were seen as, you know, uh, you know speaking down, were part of the elite telling people what to do. And, and, and without denying the importance of, of evidence, to me, I would just have that in my back pocket to be brought at, at the appropriate time and to try and build up some sort of rapport uh, with somebody who perhaps holds a very different view. It's not easy, though, I can tell you that. Thank you. John, we also have a question in the chat um, section as well. Yeah, so I, I see that there uh, from Mukash. Um, Yes, the issue of, of storage, particularly for intermittent sources of electricity production, you know, certainly on and offshore wind, 
uh, in particular. You know, it's less an issue with tidal or solar power and so on. And certainly there is research uh, going on, some of it here at Queen's University that I'm kind of tangentially involved with, of hydrogen as a, uh, essentially the, uh, a, you know, hydrogen produced from green electricity as a way of storing this energy. Um, we actually also have that now being road tested literally with Wright Bus, you know, the, the big uh, bus manufacturer in Balamina. Uh, they're developing hydrogen buses, of which we now have a few going around Belfast City in terms of trialing that. So that's where um, you can use the excess wind produced at night when we're all, in, well, I'm in bed, all you young people are probably out parking, but most of us are in bed and we're not using electricity. So what do we do with that? If we don't want to curtail it, we don't want to waste it, so can we find ways of, you know, storing it? As well as the hydrogen solution, I'm not saying that's the only one, there's also then proposals that have been developed. I, I've not really seen them take off at scale. I've, I've seen lots of discussion that actually you pump water up essentially a hill and you then have a reservoir. So the excess energy acts as a pump, pumps the water up, and then you let the water down and that then creates hydroelectricity. So I do think there are ways in which we can find solutions to the battery one. The final one for me, and I, I speak as somebody who does have a, an electric vehicle, and again, it's not the solution or the only solution to our transportation problems, but if you have an uptake of electric vehicles in a society or a city, again, if those electric vehicles are being plugged in at night time, those electric vehicles themselves become the storage, if you like, for the excess energy. And for me, that's what I think is really exciting about the challenge that faces us. What types of social, technical innovations can we come up with that can help solve our, our problems? And just as an aside, one of the advantage of having an electric car, particularly if you're able to park um, near and, and have it charging, is to remind ourselves that for most of us, when you have an internal combustion engine car, for about 90, 80% of the time you have it, what's it doing? Sitting there doing nothing. At the very least, with electric vehicles, you have the possibility that while you're not using them for a mobility purpose, you can be charging them. Uh, and therefore they can act as a, as a city's or, or, or a region's battery for renewable, renewably sourced uh, electricity. C could I ask you all a question while you're there cogitating? And forgive me for those of you who heard me speak before, you probably heard me ask this question, I'm always curious. And a part is to bring out how utterly dependent on carbon energy our societies and lifestyles are. Can anybody listening to me in the room or the, the place where you're in, can you name me one thing in the room you're in that isn't made in whole or part or transported in whole or part without the use of coal, oil or gas? And, and, and if you begin to think about that, you begin to see that we've built an entire industrial civilization based upon a non-renewable climate changing fuel. And that's going to be a big issue in terms of how do we all unlock ourselves from carbon. But anyway, have a think about that. If anyone wants to put it in uh, the chat box, if they can put a, uh, an answer. John, there's Somebody's also asked. two questions Eric. in the Q&A oh, as well. I've seen there. Eric, thank you, Eric, about uh, adaptation. I mean, I did mention it, but again, in, in passing, that we can't forget about uh, climate adaptation. My own take on this is that what we need is transformative adaptation in terms of quite radical changes, particularly to the fabric of, of our cities, never mind uh, our ways of life. You know, things like SUDs, sustainable urban drainage systems. You know, we need to find ways of adapting our buildings, our lifestyles to inevitable uh, climate breakdown. You know, sadly, you know, it, it, as I said, even if we were to stop burning fossil fuels now, uh, we built up enough uh, loading in, in the atmosphere for decades ahead, they're going to have to deal with some inevitable climate breakdown. There's issues around, you know, again, to go back to farming. Uh, what are the adaptive capacities within our farming systems we're going to have to need to uh, figure out? Will there be certain types of crops that are no longer commercially viable? You know, under some of the climate uh, change models for the island of Ireland, Again, particularly if we don't get a, a grip and start reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, the changes in the weather and the uh, climate in Ireland in the decades ahead may mean that the potato crop becomes commercially unviable and so on. 
Um, and so these are the types of tough decisions. I think the, the question Eric asks here in terms of adaptation do involve issues of triage. I don't know whether that concept is familiar to many of you. It comes from battlefield medicine, where we as a society dealing with inevitable climate breakdown are going to have to make some tough decisions about, okay, this part of Northern Ireland where we're going to build, you know, a data center or whatever, too close to the sea, sea levels are going to rise, we're going to have to stop that. Um, but this other part where we think it's on higher ground is going to be more suitable and so on. So I do think we have to start, you know, having these tough um, decisions to take in terms of triage, because uh, we probably won't be able to save everything, even in terms of biodiversity or land mass, particularly in terms of uh, sea level rises. I don't think it's going to be as acute in Britain and Ireland that it will be in other parts of the world, because that's a, the deep issue of injustice in all of this. The very people in the world who have had least to do with causing climate breakdown, people in sub-Saharan Africa, Bangladesh, South America, many parts of Asia, they are the ones who are going to suffer the most. You know, low-lying countries like Bangladesh, for example, or what we've already seen, you know, in devastating hurricanes, uh, exacerbated by climate breakdown in places like Mozambique. So the much bigger issue here in terms of both mitigation and adaptation in terms of justice, global justice, and how we, our societies in the global north, the minority world, we are the most carbon intensive. We are using a disproportionate amount of the world's carbon resources. We are the main causes of climate breakdown, and yet we're not suffering the worst impacts. So there is an issue there, and that's what, of course, the uh, sadly now uh, postponed uh, the COP, the Conference of the Parties, the, the major high-level climate negotiation that was due to happen in Glasgow towards the end of this year, which is now being rescheduled. That is a, a major issue for the Global South in terms of reparations, in terms of justice. Often these countries don't have the resources to invest in mitigation and adaptation. And I do think that prima facie, there's definitely a moral case that we in the global north need to find ways of uh, transferring resources to those countries to enable them to adapt and to engage in the low carbon transition. Uh, okay, so I, I now realise there's just two places where questions come up. Right, so this is the Q, the Q and A. Uh, Karen, how do I feel about Diane Beres's Kroger's global vision? Um, to be honest with you, Karen, I've never heard of, of this, but it looks um, very, very interesting. Uh, and I do like the idea of, you know, our, I, I actually think every Queen's graduate should be given uh, 10 trees, native trees to, to plant. And I know this has happened in, I think, Indonesia or Malaysia, where they've, uh, well, I think they've been a bit more draconian. I think they've said that if the student doesn't plant the 10 trees, they can't graduate, which I'm a little less uh, positive about. But I do think that certainly um, as somebody who's generally skeptical of geoengineering, you know, solar radiation management and so on, and putting up sulfur particles in the atmosphere, I do think tree planting for me is a nature-based geoengineering solution in terms of help, helping us cool, cool the planet and has the Brucey bonus of enhancing, you know, biodiversity habitats as we grow more trees. And as some of you know, perhaps if you live in Belfast, there is an initiative of, uh, that Belfast City Council wants to plant a million trees uh, as part of an effort to, uh, you know, reduce, uh, you know, climate breakdown. Um, Andrea, uh, living sustainably means preventing climate breakdown, but also protecting and restoring nature. Um, how will we ensure that any future changes? Well, that's going to have to be a, uh, a balance in terms of, you know, the classic one, I've done some research on this. It's just an unfortunate quirk of topography and geography that some of the best onshore wind energy resources, certainly in Ireland and Northern Ireland, happen to be in places of uh, areas of outstanding nat uh, natural beauty and high levels of biodiversity. So what should we do as a society? Do we privilege uh, capturing the wind energy resource, or do we say, no, you can't build wind farms here because it's, uh, you know, ecologically sensitive. I don't know what this, the answer is. It, to me, it'd have to be some sort of a balance. Sometimes we say, no, you, you just can't build anything there because, you know, the, the, the species and the, and the distribution of the species in this area is so, is so rare or, or fragile. 
But we do have to, again, make these difficult decisions. And the only way we can do that is, in my view, politically, but also by having a, a, a multi-criteria decision tool. You know, that's where we're not just looking at economic growth or we're not just even looking at production of renewable energy. We're looking at things like green jobs and renewable energy and maximizing biodiversity conservation. And, and I think that's, you know, one thing in terms of decision making is to have this systems approach where we're looking at there are competing uh, objectives here, which we're going to have to balance. And science will not be able to give us the answer. Science could say, yeah, if you want to build wind farms there, you can, you know, capture X amounts of terawatts of, of renewable energy, but it may be a, 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 a have a negative impact on the local ecosystem uh, and so on. So that's not, you know, science can't tell us. It can indicate when if you do this, if you make that decision, this will be the outcome. But if you make this decision, here's a different outcome. That ultimately has to come down to politics and governance and uh, making a judgment um, based around uh, the priorities of a, of a society. Uh, anonymous attendee, um, from your analysis for the Belfast Commission and your suggestion to move forward, you mentioned the that would create jobs. No, it was, it was 5,000 years of jobs. Uh, and I don't know why the, uh, my colleagues the, um, um, presented the, the job potential in terms of 5,000 years. I think it, it, it looks bigger. But actually what that is, you, you know, divide that up in terms of an average person working to 65. And I think it works out at something like 500 jobs that would be created as a result of this. So that, that's what that means. So it's not 5,000 years. It's 5,000 years of of, of work, which, you know, as I say, roughly works out at about 500 jobs. Uh, I th is that all the questions? Oh, back on the other one there we have. Um, million tree plantation versus natural forest regeneration. The ecological function is forest. To be honest, that sounds like a question way beyond my disciplinary expertise. Looks like an ecosystem, you know, if there's any biologists on the call that we might be better able to, um, to ask. And that again, again, uh, apologies, I, I, uh, I can see your name there. Um, I can't see your name, sorry. Um, so that's not an answer because I, I don't know the answer to that. That's, as I say, a different academic specialism. And that's the importance of having these interdisciplinary conversations. I have a certain level of knowledge on, in terms of, you know, policy, politics, political economy, but I don't have the, the requisite ecological knowledge or even some of the details of renewable energy, for example, which is why, for me, this is, you know, the excitement of, of perhaps what was felt by, you know, people in America engaged in, in the moonshot, you know, where they brought together these large teams and said, right, within 10 years, we're going to the moon. That's the type of uh, determined leadership and effort we really need to see. You know, that we're bringing together all our best minds, that we're actually, you know, going to put them to good use and take them out of our, in my view, frankly, the university as it's currently constructed, not just Queen's, almost every university around the world is constructed on a medieval uh, division of knowledge, which I think is completely um, uh, dysfunctional in facing the Anthropocene. That's another fancy word for the era, the era we're now in. We need interdisciplinary teams, and particularly you know, and again, to, to welcome and to big up uh, Shannon and Tanisha for organizing that early career researchers like them should be exposed to interdisciplinary ways of thinking. Because this is where the solutions are going to come from. No one discipline is going to have the answer here. So we need to bring them all together in what's sometimes called, and again, I use this a little bit advisedly, of almost like wartime mobilization. You know, we need to, these are extraordinary times. We can't have business as usual in the academy. You know, how can we, we're supposed, supposed to be smart people in the academy. The world is heading down an ecocidal path. Uh, and sometimes the knowledge that's being produced by the university is adding to the problem, not solving it. And I'm not just talking about too many academics flying around the world. And I speak as somebody who, who used to, and so on. And you say, hold on a minute, how can we be justifying practices in our professional lives, which we know is only adding to the problem? That's a minor issue in terms of our practices, although important and symbolic. My real concern is to, is to reconfigure the university so it's fit for purpose for the 21st century in terms of having in genuinely interdisciplinary conversations uh, where you have, for example, 
you know, that it's not just me. I think I might be the only person in the arts, humanities and social sciences faculty that understands some basics of the second law of thermodynamics, for example or has some basic no, uh, knowledge of ecosystem dynamics, although not enough to answer the question I was asked, but we need to have those interdisciplinary conversations or what I call, we, we need more intellectual promiscuity. It's the only form of promiscuity I, I support or condone. And that question can also be answered maybe in a second episode or in the entire series, but I totally agree as well, what you're saying, John. Okay. So does anybody have a, 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 I know this is rather odd, given the, the speaker asking the audience questions, does anybody have an answer to the, to, to the question I asked you or the puzzle? It's a great one to have at dinner parties and so on. I can give you the one answer, I, I've been asking this question for nearly 20 years now uh, in, in lectures and in public meetings and so on. It was, I forget where it was. I, I've got a, a memory that was up in Ballymena at a public meeting where I asked this question. And the answer I got back was a fly. Somebody pointed to a fly that was buzzing in uh, the room. And I said, yes, you know, you're, you're, that's the, the one thing that you could probably say. But in all my years of asking this, I've never really had a convincing uh, answer to that. But I, I, I stand to be, or I sit to be corrected if anyone <laughs> wants to contribute. Plants, okay, so, but where did the plants come from? How did they get there? Um, if you're watering your plants, do you know that the purification of our water system depends upon carbon energy? Uh, and so, well, but I, I can see where you're going uh, with that. The cabbage that we have grown, okay. Um, so how did the cabbage get from wherever you got it to where you've grown it? Did you drive to the uh, garden centre? Um, did you, did you fertilise it? Where, where did the fertiliser come from? Again, if you're watering it from your domestic sources. And, I, and again, I, I, I love this uh, question because you really begin to think about pulling back the veil of a lot of everyday practices we engage in, you just realize almost everything, you know, from the food in your stomach, you know, the contact lenses some of you may have, the synthetic clothes and others that we, we wear, clearly the electricity and the internet that's providing, you know, our experience this afternoon, you know, the embedded energy in the, in the, in the laptops and computers, everything uh, has had some carbon footprint, uh, which again, it, 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 that's the beginning of, of seeing the scale of the challenge and opportunity ahead is how to decarbonize that in a planned manner. And as I said, to go back to the report that we have uh, from the Belfast Climate Commission, again, based upon the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, we have a decade to do it, folks. You know. Okay. Nice one, Catherine. Okay, the ash and uh, the fire, the logs were grown locally. How were they cut? Uh, you know, what, uh, if you're using a, a, an electric or a, or a diesel powered, uh, you know, uh, way of cutting them up or transporting, again, almost everything you can come up with, I can show you that at some part of the process of production to consumption, carbon energy has been involved. So by hand, now I could be very flippant and say, unless you're Bruce Lee and you chop them with your own hand, I'm presuming you, you use a saw. Where was the saw made? How did it get, you see, <laughs> you can see how yeah, that was everything. I think we have a question there from Chris again, John. Yes. Sorry, just me again. Um, so what would be the best, or we've seen all at the minute the fake news and the slants that are available in the media. So how do you get the best information and keep it up to date as well? and the best methods to lower your carbon footprint because it can change and um, whenever new resources are put out and everything like that there's so what are the best methods to keep yourself up to date well to me i certainly go to reputable scientific peer-reviewed uh, research of course it's not infallible i mean this is one of the things that 
politicians and, and ordinary citizens often don't understand is the peer review process and that we can never often be 100% sure of anything. So we must always uh, have that element of doubt. And that's why we shouldn't uh, shut down climate deniers in some sort of authoritarian way. They, they have as much right to you know, air their views. Of course, we should challenge them and show how uh, you know, what they fear is not actually what the, the science and indeed the policies we can make around climate breakdown will deliver. So for me, uh, and again, without getting into too much uh, policy wonkery, as it were, the IPCC, which is the most authoritative science, is very conservative because it's not just pure science, it's also got influence by policymakers as well. So many, you know, climate scientists would be, you know, obviously not rejecting the IPCC, but point out that it's a, a consensus building mechanism, which means that A, it's usually a year, if not two more years out of date by the time its reports are published. And also because you've got so many vested interests from different countries, that uh, whatever comes out at the other end is often very, very conservative. But I still think it's a good place to, to start. But, but certainly for me, it's, you know, whether you want to go to more popular versions of this, like Greta Thunberg or David Attenborough, you know, clearly David Attenborough has a, has a scientific background. Greta Thunberg just has a genius for simplifying uh, the message. I mean, all she's saying is listen to the science. Uh, you know, that's what makes things like Extinction Rebellion and the Youth Strike for Climate Movement quite uh, unique, is that they're basically saying, you know, we're armed only with peer-reviewed science. The science is telling us we cannot continue on our high growth, high consumption, highly capitalist, globalized systems. And my only hope is that the, the COVID-19 pandemic, which has paused capitalism, it's paused forms of carbon-based consumption, but only paused it, uh, that we can use this as an opportunity to you know, rethink as we you know, rebuild. I mean, my own view is the pandemic has canceled the future. But that's okay, because it was a pretty bad one anyway. It was ecocidal, unsustainable. So for me, Chris, the, the sources of information certainly should be credible, peer-reviewed science, which of course does change. I mean, that's the nature of the scientific endeavor. But to go back to my earlier um, comment and discussion with you, we also should look at stories. You know, the, the problem with the climate story is that it's been really, really received negatively. It's presented as this sacrificial, negative, and it's almost like those of us who are promoting action on climate breakdown, we're like the teetotalers at the party, telling them, oh, don't be doing this, don't be doing that, and so on. And I think that needs radically to be changed in terms of this much more positive, transformative approach we can have to climate breakdown. You know, to go back to something I said earlier, to present this as a common vision, as a collective endeavor that we can, you know, you know, to use that phrase from a different context, let's make the earth great again. You know, that we can engage in forms of socio-technical engineering, you know, nature-based solutions that we can bring back biodiversity. Because at the moment, many of you will know, we are going through the sixth great mass extinction of life on this planet. You know, there's a Holocaust going on in terms of the more than human world. And the world that's emerging now, if we don't get a grip, on the climate emergency is not a world that I would certainly want my kids and grandkids to enter into in terms of a much more dynamically unstable earth. Uh, and it's gonna be unstable anyway. That's what the, for those of you are interested, if you want to look up the word, the Anthropocene, it means the age of the human, is effectively that we are now, as human beings, largely as a result of carbon and other land use changes and so on, we are now moving out of the, uh, the, the 11,000 or so year period of the Holocene of climate stability. And that's where most of human civilization developed. We're moving out of that now to this new dynamic geological era of the Anthropocene, where we are gonna have to adapt. To go back to the person who was talking about adaptation, we're gonna have to learn how to adapt to a much more dynamically unstable earth. And that includes what are we teaching our young people about this world that's unfolding? Uh, I think it, it, we have some, you know, education for sustainable development and maybe some rudimentary ecological knowledge being taught in schools. But we should also be teaching about the climate uh, to be able so that we're, our, our next generation are better equipped and informed in terms of how we can adapt to this new dynamically unstable earth. Because that's inevitable. You know, we cannot stop climate breakdown. What we can do is try and limit its worst 
impacts and therefore we have to both adapt as well as mitigate. Okay, I have a private message that says, if there was one thing you, that you could recommend an individual to do to tackle climate change, what would it be? Well, I've got, to, I've got to be naughty and say two things. One is to be politically active. Do not think for one moment there's an app for this, that some whiz-bang technology is going to come along and solve it. We are going to have to engage, in my view, in non-violent direct action as citizens to demand our politicians listen to the science, to demand much more radical action than we've seen up until now on climate breakdown. Again, to see in the COVID response, that's what an emergency looks like. That's the type of determined state and citizen action we're going to need to see as we collectively tackle uh, the planetary emergency. The other one I'd say is reduce your red meat consumption because of the incredible waste of water, the production of pollution, never mind carbon and so on, that's involved in producing particularly uh, red meat. It would also have the added benefit of being better for your health and certainly better for the cow. There's also a couple more questions in the Q&A section as well, John. I've seen that there. Uh, what are the future sources of energy envisaged for Northern Ireland? Is there a plan split by source? Uh, to be honest, Andrea, um, there is, yeah, yeah, at the moment, uh, the Department for Economies Energy Division, they have out for public consultation their energy strategy, uh, it, which is based, you know, the, what are the roadmaps for Northern Ireland. And as I say, it, it is a good news story that Northern Ireland has now exceeded its targets for uh, renewably generated electricity. Uh, it's now uh, up and around 45, 47%, which is above the 42% mark that uh, was specified in legislation. So we're going the right direction. Clearly, we want to get to a lot more, 80, 90%. Uh, and certainly, if you look at the uh, available assets, the, the energy assets for Northern Ireland, certainly we have lots of wind not just from academics like me, although that might be an interesting technology to try. Can we capture the wind from uh, male, pale and stale uh, professors and so on? There is, even in a climate such as ours, with the development in photovoltaic cells that, you know, it's not dependent upon heat, it's dependent upon light, we can have solar. There's also uh, incredible sources of geothermal energy that we can capture from underneath the Earth's crust. But to me, I would also flag up that, uh, and, it, and it's a mindset that we find quite common in this debate, that we say, oh, we, we have a certain quantum of carbon, energy, electricity, and so on, and we need to replace that quantum with renewable sources. Whereas I would say that's not the right way to frame this issue, is we also have to engage in energy reduction, energy conservation, you know, and not see that it's a, a like for like, is that if you go around even the university, although it's probably uh, a lot better now because nobody's in the university. I used to get my students to go around uh, in the winter when I'd be teaching a module and say, okay, after the class, go around and just count up on University Square at eight or nine o'clock tonight, how many lights are on? I'm not, I'm not saying my colleagues aren't diligent and they're in working. The vast majority probably, probably aren't. I think often what's left out of this energy discussion is the need to absolutely reduce, and we waste so much energy. Uh, and therefore, I, I think we need to say, it's not just about a quantum for a quantum. Um, that's probably some James Bond film that never got made. But it's about how do we actually say, what are our energy needs for the services and living in a, you know, a 21st century uh, society? So that's why, to go back again, I think energy efficiency, conservation, and indeed energy reduction all of which are going to require technologies and behavioural changes. Uh, and I think that would make the energy transition easier because it's not about a like-for-like like, uh, you know, transition. Um, carbon credit trading is economic theoretical. It may not bring down... Um, well, it depends upon the price of carbon. If it, well, there's two ways of looking at this. Uh, the dominant way is emissions trading systems, like the EU emissions trading system. And there was many problems with the way that was designed in terms of, of trading carbon. One is that uh, existing heavy carbon emitters were grandfathered and given quite a lot of 
credits, which in some respects they shouldn't have got, but they, that was the only way to get the system off the, off the ground. And the carbon price was too low uh, in a lot of these trading systems. I'm actually more interested in personal carbon trading systems. Uh, and there is, again, theoretical work that was done by uh, a really good London-based uh, think tank. Uh, well, they call themselves a, a, a think and do tank called the New Economics Foundation, where they looked at personal carbon tr uh, trading credits. So that each of us would be given as citizens, like in a credit card, you know, disaggregated by the IPCC carbon reductions, you know, how much, you know, giga or tons of carbon can we emit uh, on a personal level? And then we could trade these uh, and gain some benefit. And one of the advantages of that, it, it means that those on low income who tend not to fly and have a heavy carbon footprint, they'd be able to benefit uh, from selling or their uh, credits in, 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 a, in an auction system or some sort of market system. Um, so I think if you're interested, look up the personal carbon uh, personal carbon qu quotas and, and trading systems. Uh, Sam, it's not not yet. We're still um, sorry. Sam has just asked: Is the uh, the Belfast Mini Stern ready? We're still doing the final peer review of it. We're hoping probably uh, in the next couple of weeks, certainly by the end of June that we'll have maybe some press statement out, uh, around it. I, I am happy because you're a colleague. I'm happy to share with you privately uh, 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 the draft that we have, um, but hopefully by the end of June, it will be public. And this in a way will give us, you know, at least the options for, you know, what our decision makers can do in the city about which is the best bang for our book. The good news is that what we found in doing this work for the city is that the, um, the policies that are going to give us the biggest carbon reduction are also the ones that are the best value for money. And again, it's space heating. You know, it is around, you know, reducing people in fuel poverty, retrofitting our homes, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, providing local jobs. I mean, to me, that is a, a compelling vision for multiple co-benefits that can come to the city. So it, it is good that we found that the, the biggest decrease in carbon are also the ones that actually are the most cost effective uh, as well. Thank you, John. I think that's all the questions. I just want to say a big huge thank you for today for coming to speak and thank you to everyone who participated and watched as well. And stay tuned, there is another episode coming up next week and hope to see you all there. And again, thank you very much, John. No problem. My, my pleasure. Take care, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your lockdown Monday. Get out there and get some of that sun on your face. <laughs> All right, take care. <laughs>